So even if you don't know anything about fungal infection, mycormycosis, I'm sure by now you were forced to read about it and to know about it. And uh, we have seen like there is actually said to be an epidemic of uh, uh, mycormycosis in India right now. So that's about now we are going to mainly focus on the mycormycosis or the black fungus. So remember, mycormycosis is, is, uh, doesn't mean the mucor fungus per se. It's the family of uh, mucor, uh, mucor, mucorails. So if you see the kingdom in fungi, there is subtype uh, mucormycotonia, of, of which there is a mucorails, and the family is mucorasis, of which there is a specific genre, which is mucor. So remember, mucor and mycormycosis is not synonymous in that sense, and there are other species also in that. And in fact, if you see the rhizopus is rather more common than mucor. But the whole idea or the whole issue of mycormycosis is it is angioinvasive. It can lead to tissue necrosis and that's why significant mortality and morbidity. And what the types we see, the, the typical and the most common is the rhino ocular cerebral that we have already seen so many of them in the last couple of weeks. But remember pulmonary is also very common and I'm going to show at the end the pulmonary cases also. So do keep an alert to see for the pulmonary mycormycosis as well. And then there can be GIT and uh, cutaneous also. Diarrhea factor, as we all know, is the uncontrolled diabetes mellitus and the steroids are the number one and number two risk factors. So if they are there, and of course COVID-19 adds to it, it's not a high risk factor per se, but it leads to further deterioration in the immunity and especially with uncontrolled use of steroids, especially early in the disease when it is not required, has actually led to this epidemic in our country. Then of course the transplant immunotherapy, malignancy, renal failure are of course a high risk factor just like for any other immunocompromised state. But the other risk factor that you should always keep in mind is the inhalation. The basically, the patient who are on oxygen therapy, if the oxygen mask and the tubings are not clear, clean properly, then that also adds to the uh, risk factor for this fungal infection. Poor hygiene, especially mask hygiene, pe hardly people realize that if the mask itself is soaked and not uh, used properly, not thoroughly clean between uh, using, uh, again, it has to be air dried and uh, put in sunlight very clearly. The, the foggy masses mask can also lead to this uh, mycormycosis. And of course, there is a reason to believe there is a genetic predilection also because not everyone who is receiving steroids or who have uh, COVID-19 are getting it. So why does in COVID-19, but apart from immunity, if you know early in the disease also, what is what was called as the cytokine storm was the theory of uh, COVID-19 severity. And immediately people realized that there is an elevated ferritin and interleukin-6 levels and that were used as a biomarker even for the follow-up of this patient that how well they are doing. And it is actually this ferritin or the increase in the iron level which is even further helping in the mycormycosis changes. And of course, as we discussed earlier, there's a vasculopathy also. So there is already an endothelial damage that is happening due to COVID-19 itself. Then it will further help for the mycormycosis to cause angioinvasion. So this is a simple diagram that there are these risk factors of steroid diabetes and COVID-19. And it's COVID-19 per se specifically lead to increase in interleukin-6, which leads to increase in ferritin and intracellular iron, which is actually helping and further leading to increased number of cases of mycormycosis in our country. So now what about the radiology? So we'll see first the, the common type that we have seen so far is the rhino ocular cerebral type. So again, MRI with contrast is the investigation of choice. But as we know, in our country, it might be difficult to get MRI in every patient. Then CT scan also can help. And in, in fact, most of the cases we have the CT scan findings also present. But in MRI, we know that one particular sign, which is the black turbinate sign, is very, very sensitive for this. And once you see this, so that's why whenever you do MRI, please ensure that you give contrast because this is what will, will help you to pick up this black turbinate or the non anising or the necrose turbinate over and above the finding of the sinusitis. Again, the mucosa will also be non enhancing in case of mycormycosis. And this is the sign that we will specifically look for when calling something mycormycosis. This is another such example where you see the turbinate is entirely necrosed and non enhancing That is the black turbinate sign. And remember, diffusion restriction can also help you. So if you see this case, Whenever you see or you are doing the MRI for this purpose, always run the diffusion scan also, and you will see this diffusion restriction also in cases of mucormycosis. But remember, black turbinate is not a specific sign of mucormycosis or for that matter, any other immunocompromised condition. Black turbinate sign can be seen even in immunocompetent cases, but it shows little difference. So if you see the initial example that I showed, there was a 
entire turbinate was uh, seen as a black or the necros or a non enhancing turbinate usually this immunocompetent patient who get this black turbinate size will typically involve just the posterior aspect most more even can be bilateral but this posterior aspect rather than the entire turbinate you may see such thin internal septation if you see those black turbinate are completely jet black turbinate while well, you see some internal septation in this cases and you will see some preserved enhancement like in this case also if you see this is a peripheral thin enhancement that is present rather than the entire black turbinate at what we saw here there is no peripheral enhancement the entire or the most of the turbinate is involved there is no septation delineable within them then you know that that's a true black turbinate but if you see any of this sign especially in a immunocompetent patient don't uh, jump to directly mucormycosis unnecessarily so then comes the ct because that's actually the workforce uh, workhorse for mucormycosis because not everybody is getting mri done so then you will see a hyperdense soft tissue that can help you to call anything as a fungal infection but important is ct is an excellent modality for to look for erosions and osteolysis so if the disease has progressed enough to cause this changes then of course the ct will also help you pick up this findings very easily so let's see some of the typical types that we saw that we are going to see so if you there is a cerebral or the ocular involvement in addition to the, the typical uh, nasal sinuses involvement then you will see a intraorbital soft tissue thickening of the intra uh, extraocular muscle commonly the medial rectus but of course it is not that there is any predilection for that and that i'll show you in examples there can be optic neuritis cavernous sinus thrombosis and when there is a cavernous sinus thrombus always look for the arterial thrombosis and related infarcts and other intracranial extension so this is what we uh, typically seen just a rhino mucormycosis where there is no extension otherwise what you see here is there is a diffuse sinusitis there is near complete opacification of all the sinuses except the sphenoid sinus but on top of it what you see is the clear erosion osteolysis in all the walls of the maxillary sinus even if you see on the left side there is some involvement of the orbital floor also and don't forget to even see this area the maxillary or the palatine process and the alveolar processes they also start showing erosions where very commonly and once you see them you know that you are not dealing with simple sinusitis but there is a invasion or the invasive fungal sinusitis similarly in this example if you see there are lots of osteolysis in the floor as well as along the uh, floor of orbit as well and then if you see in addition what you see here is the intraorbital soft tissue predominantly in the extracranial compartment and which which rectus muscle involved here is the inferior rectus so remember it's not that the medial rectus has to be present like many of the times people always look for a medial rectus involvement or the thickening before calling mucormycosis is not the case because it's a simple common sense it's, it's the involvement by invasion or the local invasion so if there's a maxillary sinus disease leading to the floor uh, floor osteolysis which further leads to the extension in the orbit of course the inferior rectus will be involved first and that is what we see in this example as again this there is a ethmoid sinusitis which is the uh, uh, pathology along with of course there is a fungal uh, there is a maxillary involvement also but this time the lamina papyracea is completely gone the medial wall of the orbit which has led to the intraorbital extension and then of course the nearest rectus muscle is the medial rectus so now you will see the medial rectus involvement so remember it's not that something a, a golden rule that the medial rectus has to be involved it is actually what sinus and what is the path of Uh, invasion that the mucormycosis is following so as we saw earlier this was the case of uh, floor involvement with inferior rectus while this is a case of medial rectus then why not the superior rectus so just in this example this was a case with frontal sinusitis if you see the maxillary sinus are completely clean but this patient has actually the frontal sinusitis which has led to thinning and erosions in the roof of the orbit leading to the invasion of the orbit and that's why what we now see is the superior rectus involvement so remember don't Uh, jump to the conclusion if the, the medial rectus is normal as in this case it cannot be mucormycosis it can still be basically what we are looking for is the sign of invasion and similarly this case, case i recently saw and of course we all know that any fungal invasive infection you have to and have to look for the pterygo palatine fossa because once the disease has spread to pterygo palatine fossa we know that it's like it's like a multi gate uh, chamber and from there the lesion can extend into multiple pathways intracranially intra orbitally in the mouth in the nose and that's what had happened here the patient has a posterior ethmoid sinusitis you see you can see some erosions in the walls and what has happened is through this sphenopalatine foramen the disease has directly progressed even if it is a mild soft tissue because of this sphenopalatine foramen it has uh, extended into the pterygopalatine fossa directly and this patient is really at a high risk for further intracranial and other extension and needs to be uh, treated very aggressively and followed up also 
so this was initially first we saw the uh, the rhino micromycosis then the ocular part now we are going to see the intracerebral extension and if you see something as gross as this that the ethmoid sinus is involved the entire uh, anterior cranial fossa floor is uh, showing osteolysis and which has led to the in, uh, extension of the soft tissue or the abscess in the frontal lobe and again it can show cavernous sinus involvement and if there is a thrombosis of internal carotid artery it can even show such large infarct so always keep in mind that you need to see all the possible uh, local uh, site of extension and in invasion in case of mucormycosis and if at all required you have to do additional imaging like mri or, or any other test that will require to prove the angio invasion and even the this type of complications this was another example where because of this right ethmoid sinusitis has led to direct extension in the uh, middle cranial fossa with a nice abscess seen in a temporal lobe and it actually led to the complete thrombosis of the right internal carotid artery because of direct extension in the cavernous sinus